very high. If we can affect larger numbers of people and actually change whole communities and families and generations, then we can really see um, the most significant reduction in recidivism, in addiction, et cetera. One of the things I wanted to say about the issue of the warden, um, in what, what I see about um, organizational change in the prison system is sort of like what I'm seeing in the court system, and that is wardens, when a judge calls a meeting, people show up and people come to the table and are willing to talk about what we need to do differently. And it's people from all walks of life who come to the tables convened by a judge. I sort of see that happening a little bit with wardens in their communities convening um, the same kind of a broad, far-reaching table. So you have community-based providers, you have advocates, you have family members. And it doesn't happen everywhere, but in those prisons where you have a real commitment to treatment and recovery, I'm seeing that kind of um, process supported by the leadership of, of wardens. You know, that's a good point because oftentimes people still think of the James Cagney movies where you send people to prison, they get put in a cell and you beat them up three or four times a day. When in fact most of your wardens and administrators and correctional staff are highly educated and motivated. We really want to see people change. Our goal is always we don't want them back. We hope that having that experience will allow them to go back and, and adjust to the community. So in those places, like the example I told you about Willard Easy earlier, is that in fact you have a treatment modality where you involve it and then you bring them into the community and continue to follow them. If we simply let them go and don't follow them up, our chance of success is, is small. But in fact, in those communities where people work together and we talk to each other, and we just, in New York we have contractors, so we will talk to our private contractors who provide in and out patient services to those people. In fact, the chance for success is much greater. So, Annie, why is it important for families to be engaged in the reentry process? What does that do for the, for the person that's come out of prison? My personal opinion on this is it depends on the family. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Some families are not good for the reentry process. Mm -hmm. Some families are very helpful and very supportive. If you look at the fact that today we are dealing with at least third, fourth, and fifth generation addicts, okay? They have grown up in this culture. To them, this is what life is. You grow up, you get high, you go to prison, you get out. Your kids get high, go to prison, get out. Mm -hmm. And they... They need to be shown something different than that. They, they need to be shown, sometimes removed from that environment and shown that, that this is not normal. This is not acceptable. It's not normal. It's, you deserve so much more than this. There's so much out there more than what you have been shown in this life. Are they encouraged then to go into fellowship programs or mutual support groups in order to find a very healthy Oh yes, uh, oh yes. Parallel support, to yes, the family. Yes, support is of the utmost importance. You are taking someone from an environment that they grow up in and sticking them in and expecting them to be in an entirely different if I took you and moved you to Egypt all alone and dropped you off and said, "Well, good luck to you, honey," yeah, uh, you would not know what to I do you with were yourself. Put me in the desert. <laughs> Anywhere, you would not know how to function, what to do with yourself, where to go, what to do. You would be. Uh, I would love to be a tourist in Egypt. Yes, with a guide. Preferably, right. you know, well, you have to kind of look at it in that sense. You can't just say, okay, go out there, live a good life, do good things. When the person has no tools, no skills, no even information on what that consists of. And so support is the utmost importance that you can guide them to, to what is a better, you could say, here's a better life, go live it. If they have no idea what you're talking about, they're not going to find that on their own. Can I say something sure. about that, Yvette? Um, it, it's what Franny does and, what, and who Franny is is really important in this process because it's not just telling folks that there's another way and telling folks that they can make it. She's showing people that she did it. She knows what she's talking about. It was very hard. It wasn't easy. But she's very credible, and she gives people hope because they can relate to her. Mm -hmm. And they see her, and they think, I can do it. Yes. 
I can do it. And, and that's what they need to believe. Faye mentioned hope. Hope is so important, especially when you're talking about generations of families affected by right. addiction and all these other disadvantages. And so seeing somebody make it, like Franny, so recovery supports, um, self-help groups, all of those kinds of things where people can create new relationships, new um, uh, support networks, mm -hmm. and a new vision for their new identity. Absolutely. Faye. Well, I also wanted to state that, you know, that, you know, one of our big changes is recognizing that we need to involve everyone in this process. A lot of times people forget, for example, the correctional officers who work in prisons or probation officers. These are people, you know, they know lots of people. In fact, you know, almost half of Americans, if you ask them, will know someone who has a substance use disorder. And so we need role models that work in the systems that can help people really, you know, um, you know, show a way. But we also need healthy and working places for correctional staff um, because part of, you know, Part of the unspoken truth is that prisons, you know, are unhealthy places for staff to work in, probation mm -hmm. offices, you know, and if we want people to be, you know, more productive, then we need workplaces that support that. And so these changes that we've all been talking about this morning are really important because we can deter criminal behavior, we can correct these generational problems, um, and we can help people become part of society if we just really no make the commitment that we have to be more concerned about people's healthiness. And could contribute to lowering our health costs and our and, social And all costs. of this, because this yeah. is all chronic care Absolutely. issues, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right. Well, it's been a great program. Uh, of course, I want to remind you all and our audience that September is National Alcohol and Drug Addiction Recovery Month, and as such, it's a wonderful opportunity for individuals like yourself and your agencies and others to generate activities and events commemorating the wonderful nature of recovery and applauding those that are in recovery. Uh, so I want to remind our audience to start planning uh, their event for September 2009. It's been a great show. Thank you so much for coming. Every September, National Alcohol and Drug Addiction Recovery Month provides an opportunity for communities like yours to raise awareness of alcohol and drug use disorders and highlight the effectiveness of treatment. 2009 will mark the 20th anniversary of this annual celebration of addiction treatment and recovery. In order to help your organization plan events and activities in commemoration of this year's Recovery Month observance, the Free Recovery Month Kit offers ideas, materials, and tools for planning, organizing, and realizing an event or outreach campaign that matches your goals and resources. To obtain your copy of this year's Recovery Month Kit, and gain access to other free publications and materials related to addiction treatment and recovery issues, visit the Recovery Month website at www.recoverymonth.gov or call 1-800-662-HELP. It's important that everyone become involved because addiction is our nation's number one health problem and treatment is our best tool to address it. For a copy of this program or other programs in the Road to Recovery series, call SAMHSA at 1-800-662-HELP or order online at recoverymonth.gov and click Multimedia.